with helping you make the most of your capital and your time and eliminating counterproductive habits like allowing emotions to influence your thought process, chasing headlines, and chasing returns, which we all know when you, you, you can chase returns, but you can never catch them. So this is really about answering your questions, bringing you topics that we find important for you to think about and implement in your investment process. And we do this by giving you useful data and my unbiased perspective developed with over 20 years of investment experience. So Invest Talk is really about helping you take the next step in your journey towards financial freedom. And to that end, this podcast is your opportunity to ask your finance and investment questions. So let's get started. I'm ready to take ready to tackle your questions. You've got a call right now at 888 chart. Now, my focus point today looks into the story behind this headline. You don't have to know everything to invest well. And obviously, you can never know all the information out there and balance it properly. But I'm going to elaborate on how to think about streamlining the process of making a decision. I know a lot of people struggle with that because of so much data coming in, but I want to uh, break that down a little bit further, and I think that'll be a good uh, topic for us to discuss. Also, the economy is a bit confusing, and we're going to break down why that is. There are parts of the economy that are doing great, others not, not very well at all, and that means a lot of cross currents. And for many people, that's confusing. And that's why a lot of people have missed this rally this year, because they were so adamant that there would be a, a, a major recession or something because they were looking at one or two numbers. Well, the market's made of uh, the economy's made up of a lot of different numbers, a lot of different opinions, a lot of different hard and soft data, we're going to dig into that even more. Also, there's a tax break that a lot of high income earners are losing. And, and frankly, you don't have to be that high income. It's those that are earning more than $145,000 in the previous year. And this one was, was, this is if you're over 50, making over 145,000 a year, this is a topic for you because it will likely pertain to you, especially if you're trying to save a lot. Okay. And then lastly, we're gonna look at earnings season. We just started it last week. And what has it said so far? And what will the outcome ultimately be? And what does it say about corporate profits? So we're going to look at that. What else are we going to get into? One is uh, our voice bank questions. Uh, one is on Borg Warner, BWA, and ETF's maturity. If we have time, we also have an iTunes review question as well. And I also have a perspective segment on the history of U.S. savings bonds that go back to 1776. So I will explain so we have this all planned for this hour with you, but most importantly, this is about your live calls. We have a lot of plans for each episode. I know we typically don't get to all of what we plan to get to because we put your live calls first, so that's what's most important. So give us a call at 888 chart and let's take a look at the market today. It was a modest up day. You had the large caps up about about 45 basis points, small caps are up 70 basis points, 0.70%. And a nice start to the week after we pulled back on uh, modestly on Friday on bank earnings. And what did the banks do today? Did they recover? Yeah, they had a nice little up day. So we'll see if there's uh, they didn't break above yesterday or Friday's high, so that's something of note. And I'll be watching to see what kind of follow through we get over the next few days, especially in the bank stocks. And then will that feed into the the rest of the market? And certainly, you are going to continue to have earnings numbers that come in that uh, will will color how the market is thinking uh, about different sectors. And you could have major accelerations to the upside or major reversals. And that's what I'm watching for is what type of major reversals are we going to get from large individual names, uh, sectors as a whole, as, as, as more and more come in, uh, because that's going to tell us a lot about what, what's happening uh, in the earnings picture and how the most importantly is how the markets are reacting to them, what guidance is look like going forward. 
right? So that's what uh, I'm on the watch for. We have, what do we have tomorrow? We have Bank of America tomorrow before the market opens. We have Schwab, Morgan Stanley, Lockheed Martin, Bank of New York Mellon, Prologis, Synchrony Financial. We have a lot of news or a lot of earnings announcements that I think will move the markets tomorrow. All right. So that's what we have on the docket for today. We can talk about that or whatever's on your mind. Let's pivot over to our first listener question now. Hi, Justin and Steve. This is Kyle Woodyard from Michigan. I'm a longtime listener, and I had a question about a stock. The ticker symbol is ADI Analog Devices, Inc., and I want to know if it was a good buy now or at what price would it be a good buy. I'm looking forward to hearing your answer on the podcast because I'll definitely be listening. Thank you for all that you guys do. Bye. All right, looking at analog devices, ADI, and what they do is they make analog mixed signals, signal integrated circuits, amplifiers, detectors, diodes, very, I would say, basic chips overall. Not your high-end graphic processing chips or, or CPUs, things like that. These are more small-level basic uh, function chips that go into cars, they go into industrial equipment, they even go into wireless infrastructure equipment, and that's most, most of their business. And what I like about this is that while it's not sexy, right, it's not going to change the world, it's not AI driven in any way, it's just a consistent performer, consistent performer. That's analog devices, ADI, about a $98 billion market cap, very minimal debt on its balance sheet, and 1.6% dividend, but they continue to increase that dividend over time. So it's a dividend grower, and it's an earnings grower as well. So I'm going to give this one a thumbs up. Once again, it's not the sexiest one out there. It's, it's not a... It's not going to change the world, but it, their products go into so many essential uh, businesses that are growing. We talked about the boom in manufacturing, and analog devices is going to benefit from that. And if you look long term, the return on equity is right around eleven percent, twelve percent. That's pretty good. It's I mean, it's it's not great. It's not amazing, but it's solid and it's consistent. And their cash flow is consistent. It's trading at reasonable multiples about. Uh, 4% free cash flow yield. Earnings are expected to go up 10% this year. Those uh, estimates are going up. Technicals are fine. I'm going to give analog devices a thumbs up. I like it. Now we're heading into a break. I welcome your finance and investment questions now. So give Invest Talk a call at 888 chart When listener questions are played on the Invest Talk podcast, how do you guys determine a value stock? The caller voices are amplified many thousands of times. Just wanted to get your opinion on JP Morgan and BAC. How do you see this uh, looking forward? I'm 25 years old and have a question about retirement funds. And the unbiased answers from Justin Klein. That's why it's trading so cheap because there's a lot of regulatory risk. Here. And Steve Peasley. I, I kind of like it here. If I was going to buy Tyson Food, this is where I'd buy it. Benefit the entire Invest Talk community. Thank you for what you guys do. That's why 24 7, rain or shine, no matter how simple or how complex, your questions make a difference. Symbol BKE, what's your outlook? And Invest Talk is made better by the power of you. So don't forget to call 888 99 chart. Every Invest Talk podcast is made better by your questions. So don't forget to call. And if you've never called, Justin and Steve are waiting now for your finance and investment questions. Invest Talk, 888 99Chart. Now, my focus point today looks in the story behind this headline. You don't have to know everything to invest well. And you may have. You have heard at some point someone saying, uh, giving you an investment idea. Maybe, maybe that was 
a family member, maybe that was a friend of yours, maybe it was an influencer you found on social media, maybe that's a podcaster like myself, right? Uh, and you thought it was a good idea. And you make a decision to buy a stock, buy an investment. And you're doing that with obviously incomplete information, just one person's opinion. You might have done some other ancillary research and you just, you pull the trigger. And sometimes there's nothing wrong with that because you can't do all the research on every single investment opportunity that you can potentially buy before you make that decision, right? That's what it would mean to have all the information is to know everything about what it, what's out there in the marketplace. And we know that's impossible, right? The investing world is infinitely complex. And so it's effectively impossible to do that type of research. But it doesn't mean that you can't be informed enough. And that's really what it's about being informed enough and having the right habits in order to avoid some of the biases that we naturally have. Okay. So the first thing that we're prone to be, to do is we're prone to overweight the information that is top of mind, right? The opinion you saw or heard online, the article that you just read, the story that you just heard, whatever that is, whether it's accurate or not, but it's top of mind because it was in front of you, right? What you're not weighing is all the other articles and opinions that are out there on other stocks or other uh, assets. And that's those, those opinions are in front of you. It just happened to be what was what you encountered. Okay. So that availability bias is one thing you have to overcome. Now, the second is we tend to seek out information that supports our current beliefs. And this is called confirmation bias. We do this all the time, especially I see this a lot in the political realm. I'm a very centrist person. So I see people on the left and the right. They, they seek out the information uh, about the other side that supports their, their belief. And that's natural. That's it's who we are. We're tribal. It's, 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 tri it's tribalism. And that's part of confirmation bias. And so these are the two main ones that kind of lead you astray because you overgeneralize topics that are in front of you and you ignore a part, important piece of information that go, that go against your typical bias, right? Now, there's three things you can do to try to counteract that, though. And the first thing is slow down. Don't make rash, quick decisions. And when you make rash, quick decisions, you rely a lot on those cognitive biases. And it's because it's an easy, automated way of, of thinking. So give yourself time to think about it over a few days. Allow your brain to engage in more thoughtful effortful uh, process, and that can counteract part of that, that, that bias, especially that what's in front of you bias, right? Going out and looking and finding other pieces of information, other alternatives that you could go down, okay? Number two is be the devil's advocate, okay? Prove yourself wrong. That'll help you get over the confirmation bias and say, what's the other side? This opinion says, or this article says, I should buy it. What would the argument be of, no, you shouldn't buy it, or maybe you should sell that particular position, okay? And so gathering that evidence and then weighing it against the, that original side will help you compare them more directly and come, a, come with a more balanced approach. And number three, find somebody you trust with, that will give you honest feedback that maybe has different biases than you, that will bring up different things that you probably didn't even think about, and all those will help you make more informed, less irrational decisions, okay? Now we're heading into a break. I'm ready to take your calls live at 888-99-CHART. The 
stock market is volatile. It's constantly changing. So how are you positioned? Is your portfolio properly balanced or are you taking unnecessary risks? You can get guidance anytime for free if you go to investtalk.com and take the brief Riskalyze quiz. Let's go to David in Ohio looking at AT&T and Verizon. Hi, Justin. Thanks for taking my call. Yeah. Um, your, th- your thoughts on uh, Verizon and AT&T took a big drop today, I guess due to like lead shielded cables that were installed in the 1960s. Mm-hmm. Is this a buying opportunity or just your thoughts? Well, that depends on the cost of them getting rid of them. And that is... You know, these liabilities tend to, and in the overhang, and that's really the issue here is, is, is especially near term, is when there are when, when there are problems with potential litigation, you know how litigation goes. It gets tied up in courts for a long period of time. And this is just the start of uh, the potential for uh, this being an issue. And... It's hard to know exactly where it will go, how much liability they will have, what costs they will have to inherit, uh, et cetera. In, in, that, in cases like this, I just don't touch it until there's some more clarity uh, because it just drags on and it weighs on the stock and, and it just doesn't, uh, it, it's not good risk, risk versus reward until you start to see you know, the technicals improve and the technicals obviously aren't improving on either. So this is, these are both uh, names that just don't touch them. <laughs> just watch them. And wait, and and that's sometimes that's often uh, the the best course of action because of the lack of clarity uh, here. Um, now they both companies with a lot of debt, um, a, a competitive industry. Uh, their dividends are high, and you know they are under attack on the competitor front as well with T-Mobile. So uh, I would say do nothing with with it. Okay, thank you. Okay, no problem. Thanks for the call. Now let's dig into the economy as a whole. And a lot of people are confused at really a lot of cross currents in the economy, really contradictory economic gauges. And a lot of indicators that before would show a recession are not manifesting in the broad numbers. Okay. And this is a Great example of why investors need to stay flexible. If you are tied to one viewpoint or another, oftentimes you, going back to the biases I discussed before, you find those data points that will confirm your, your viewpoint of the market. There's a lot of, I call it doom porn on the internet, right? Uh, you, you have the, uh, was it, uh, zero hedge is one great example. It's been around a long time and people love it. There's YouTube channels that all they do is about doom porn, uh, that, that the housing market's going to crash or the economy is going to crash or the stock market's going to crash. It's all going to hell in a handbasket and you need to get out and be ultra safe with your money. And what they do is they take small arguments and they confound them and they ignore the other side, right? I talked about making the, that, those balanced decisions. And what they do is they're the exact opposite. They're just finding everything to confirm their bias and their viewers love that, okay? Because that's their bias as well. But in reality, there's always two sides of the coin. And it's never been more apparent uh, in, in the economic numbers that – there are different messages, mixed messages being sent. Now, the bond market is predicting the uh, economy continue to slow and, and a recession uh, on the horizon, while stocks are happy with a pretty decent economy. Now, the bond market thinks there's going to be rate cuts over the next couple of years, and that's because typically because there's a recession. In the stock market, however... Cyclicals have outperformed the defensive sectors, and that is portending to a soft landing for the economy. 
And then if you look at the economic data, manufacturing is in trouble while the services side of the economy is booming. And manufacturing has typically been an early warning sign for the state of the economy. And it gets far more attention, but it's a quarter to a third of the overall economy. Services are, are far more uh, important. And the gap between the ISM services and the manufacturing gauges is the third largest it's been in its history. So manufacturing is contracting while services are expanding and actually ticking up this last month. Construction is also divided. You have housing permits, housing starts. Those are all down dramatically year over year, while construction spending is up 76%. Sorry, construction spending on manufacturing facilities are up 76% year over year. And then there's the soft versus hard data. Sentiment data, when, where people call up and ask what you're thinking about the economy and your business, versus the hard data, which is what the economic indicators are saying, that's very wide as well. And so sentiment is in influencing that. So the soft data is soft, whereas the hard data is, is very strong. And this just goes to show you that you can't, you have to take both sides of, of, of the coin. You have to really uh, look at that. And, and I always lean more on the hard data. Sentiment can be influenced, I think, a lot by uh, the political environment that we're in. And, and that can be a big explainer as well. So don't be... Don't, don't be frustrated if you're confused. The economic numbers are confusing as well, but ultimately the stronger ones uh, are the more reliable ones. All right. Now we're heading to a break, so give me a call now at 888-99-CHART. Everybody wants a secure financial future, but getting there takes strategy, discipline, and the right information. Justin Klein is ready to provide his unbiased answers. So don't forget to call Invest Talk, 888-99-CHART. Let's go talk to Paul in Concord looking at Broadcom, AVGO. Hi, Justin. Uh, thanks for taking my call. Of course. wanted to get your take on Broadcom. It's uh, a position that I've held for... Uh, a while now and have built up a nice gain and just want to get your take on it. It's in a balanced portfolio of mine and I just want to get your take on what you might, might do if you had been holding. Uh, is there a more upside or is it maybe a good time to trim and take some profits? I think it's a good time to trim and take some profits. This is a, a very good company. Broadcom's operating history is very profitable, and I like that it, they have very minimal debt on their balance sheet. But if you look at the multiples that it's trading at, price sales ratio is at 11 times. You know, anything over 10 is usually pretty rich. And now we're at 11, which is the highest price sales ratio that it's ever been at. And in history, you know, if you just go based on more like profitability, uh, price to uh, or price to free cash flow. That's at 22 times, and that was right near uh, higher than the peak that we saw uh, earlier last year. So you know, I I like Broadcom as a company, but this recent run, this is an opportunity where I would probably take a bit of profits. Obviously, you have to think about taxes, and you know, probably don't want to sell it all here. Uh, but this is, uh, you always want to be, it's like grandpa's old saying, buy when there's sellers, sell when there's buyers. Well, there's a lot of buyers right now. And I think uh, the broad semiconductor space is a bit overvalued. And this is uh, one of those ones that is definitely overvalued at these prices. So um, I, I, I like the company, but I do agree this is a time to trim. Thanks so much. No problem. Thanks for the call, Paul. Now, my perspective today looks in the history of the United States savings bonds. Now, first, what is a savings bond? Well, they are non-marketable securities, treasury securities, and they've been continuously sold since 1935. And they were introduced by then Secretary Henry Mor Morgenthau Jr. and as a means of encouraging broad public participation in government financing by making these available in small denominations, specifically to small investors, right? Not having to put out thousands and thousands of dollars to buy a treasury bond, for example. And now 
Henry Morgenthau. He was the Treasury Te Secretary from January 1st, 1934, up until July 22nd, 1945. And under the provision of the original Federal Reserve Act, the Treasury Secretary was also ex officio chairman of the Federal Reserve Board at that time. Now, he was born in 1891, died in 1967, but he believed that in his government role, he should only consider prudence as a guide. He believes that he believed that realism was practical for government policies. And, uh, and further that universal moral principles must be filtered through the concrete circumstances of time and space. And only then should be prudently applied to the actions of the state. And so he had a lot of very strong, uh, moral backing for this. And he felt that if you had citizens that were invested in the government, well, they will be more invested in their country. So let's go back to savings bonds. The Treasury securities have been offered at various times in our history dating back to 1776. And they'd always been marketable, meaning there's market fluctuations, you can go out and sell them if you wanted to. But many Small savers, particularly those of Liberty bonds during World War I, experienced considerable losses when forced to sell them prior to their maturity. So in contrast, the savings bond was designed to be less susceptible to market conditions. It was type of security with a schedule of fixed interest payments and redemption value, redeeming at any time after a short holding period for the purchase plus accrued interest. So a savings bond was issued in registered form, not negotiable, and could be replaced in the event of loss or destruction. So since 1935, when President D. Roosevelt signed legislation creating the first baby bond, United States savings bonds have encouraged savers and broad participation by Americans in government financing. And there's four successive series of these baby bonds, A, B, C, and D, from 1935 to 1941, denominated in 25, from 25 up to $1,000. And they were sold at 75% of face value and paid 2.9% interest when held until their full 10-year maturity. Now, that wasn't a lot, but interest rates were pretty low back then. Uh, total sales at issue price of the four series were approximately $4 billion, which at that time, that's a lot of money. Okay. The last baby bond matured and ceased earning interest April 1951. And obviously, there's a lot more to this story, but you can still directly invest in, we, we all know there's the, um, there's the inflation-linked bonds that you can buy uh, directly with the Treasury, and you can do that over at treasurydirect.gov. I always think that's a good resource for anybody trying to put some money to work and they want it super safe. You don't need uh, any intermediary, you can go straight to the, the government and purchase uh, all different types of treasury securities. Now let's go back to the Invest Talk Voice Bank for a question that came in earlier on 888-99 chart. Hi, my name is Marcos from Huron, California, and I'm calling about BWA, Org Warner. It's my play on uh, autos. And like you said, Justin, they uh, build chassis and propulsion systems for automobile vehicles and i believe the fundamentals are great but i was just wondering if you think that this has a long time to run up and uh want to know your thoughts and i haven't held it for about six months and uh i think it's doing good but it keeps hitting resistance and not going anywhere but uh i just want to know your thoughts on it fundamentals are good chart looks good and i just wanted to hear what you your opinion on it and when the 50-day moving average crosses the 150-day moving average, is that a bull signal? One of them out of three. But the 200-day moving average has to start tilting up, and that is a bull signal is what I was taught. I've been searching and learning about investing for about four or five years, thanks to you guys. And I learned about these technical signals on a few guys on YouTube and when I look back at the charts, every time the 50 crosses the 150 and the 200 starts lightening up, it's a very good bull market trend. I just want to know your thoughts about that. Thank you. Looking forward to hearing your thoughts. Bye-bye. 
All right. Well, on the technical side, I do like to see all the major moving averages pointed up, and that is the case in this one. I don't tend to like the 150. I look more at the 100 uh, day moving average, but overall, this trend is positive. I will say that. Now, Borg Warner, for everyone else out there, this is one of the biggest auto parts supplier to the major OEM manufacturers. They make turbochargers, e-boosters, timing systems, emission systems, thermal systems, gasoline ignition technology, powertrain sensors, cabin heaters, etc. So well diversified in the products that they sell to the major manufacturers. Uh, their largest customers are Ford and Volkswagen. Uh, Europe accounts for 34% of their revenue. Asia and North America were 32% each. So you can see they're broadly geographically diversified, which I like. And they, they're they not relying on one particular auto manufacturer to, hit, to do great, right? So, and historically, these are much better business. They run a much better, more profitable business than the major OEM manufacturers. If you just look at their profitability in, in throughout their history, it's typically in the mid to high teens, which is good. Right now, it's at about 13.5%. So they're, they're about a little bit under earning compared to history, but that's fine for me. Uh, I think it is modestly undervalued uh, here at these levels. If you look at price to sales ratio, 0.6 times, your enterprise value even about uh, six and a half times. So that's very cheap. Price to cash flow at 17 times. And I'm I'm a fan of this. Uh, I, I think the technicals, like you said, are shaping up nicely. They're in a nice uh, uptrend. It's a 1.5% dividend, but I think they can uh, continue to raise that dividend, which they have been doing. If you look at their debt, it's only about $4 billion on a $10 billion market cap. Times interest earned is 29 times, so they certainly can afford uh, their, their, uh, their debt. And these are the type of names. That so many people focus on the car companies as, as an investment, and historically, they're much worse investments than the the actual parts suppliers because, and there's oftentimes there's a lot more innovation happening at these parts suppliers than at the, the larger companies. And you know, there's less to do, right? Think of a car company. You have to have uh, a lot of service infrastructure and sales infrastructure and all that. Whereas these parts suppliers, they are benefiting whether the margins for the car companies are good or not. And they have a sales fleet, but they only have to deal with, you know, a handful of large suppliers and, and work with them. And this, the, the large OEMs don't have much choice here. They only have a few that they work with, uh, especially that they can get these more sophisticated systems from. And Borg Warner is, is one of those, one of a handful. And historically, it's one of the better ones. So I'm going to give Borg Warner a thumbs up. That's BWA. All right. Now let's touch a bit on a change that's new coming next year. And this is part of a recent, recent tax update. And it's going to affect a lot of savers that are over 50, earning over $145,000 per year in the previous year. And they're trying to do a catch-up contribution in the 401k. Now, the max you can put in a 401k is $22,500 per year if you're under 50. But if you're over 50, you can do what is called a catch-up contribution with up to $7,500, totaling $30,000. But now that's going to change, meaning that you can still make your normal $22,500 contribution if you make over that 145, but your catch-up contribution is going to now have to start going into an after-tax Roth IRA account. So you can still do it. It's just now in a Roth 401k versus a traditional 401k. And this is part of new rules set by Congress passed this last December. Now, currently, as of last year, only 16% of eligible participants, meaning those that are over 50 and contributing to the 401k, only 16% of them took advantage of that catch-up contribution. And so what this means is if you're earning a good amount and you're in a decently high tax bracket, you're going to 
instead of getting a write-off of that 7,500, remember that's a deduction of 7,500 for your income, which means, means you'll save at a 35% tax bracket, $2,625 per year. Or if you are in the 22% tax bracket, that's a $1,650 savings per year. Now you're going to put the full amount in. You're going to pay the full tax on that 7,500, but you don't have to pay tax going forward. Okay. Now the good thing is this does not apply to normal IRAs, which also have a thousand dollar catch up contribution if you're over 50. So it doesn't matter your, your income on that. There are some, there are some complexities with the deductibility of that as well. If you're depending on your income, something you want to talk to your CPA about, but that's not changing. Okay. This is only for 401k catch up contributions. Okay. Now, this is not necessarily the worst thing in the world. What I think it's actually forcing a lot of savers into what I call tax diversification. As a lot of people think, oh, I'm working, I'm working, especially in your latter years, you might be making a lot of money, you might be in a high tax bracket. Well, a lot of people say you shouldn't put into a Roth IRA. However, if you have so much money in a traditional IRA, or sorry, traditional IRA and for a traditional 401k, when it comes to taking RMDs at 73, it can be so high that you're automatically pushed into a very high tax bracket. And that can be an issue as well, especially if you add it into Social Security and other income that might be coming into you. I think this forces a lot of people into more tax diversity, which I kind of like. So very interesting um, set of rules that are coming down the pipe, but I wanted to make you aware of that because some of you may be taking advantage or thinking of taking advantage of that Roth or, or that catch-up contribution and know that that's not going to be tax deductible anymore if you're making too much money. Right. Now, for those of you who may be new to Invest Talk, let me assure you that I'm always careful to give you my straight, unbiased answer. No hidden agenda here. And most the, the most important, uh, sorry, it will mostly be your questions that drive the direction of today's podcast per usual. And one thing is for sure that today's investing situation is very different from what we've seen over the past several decades. And that means we have higher inflation now, higher interest rates, and all of this is feeding into the market. So if you need help understanding how this current environment will impact your strategy, your portfolio, your ability to retire, and how you can avoid the pitfalls of this new market, I encourage you to reach out to myself or Steve Peasley at our company, KPP Financial. Set up a free portfolio review assessment via telephone or go to meeting. And I also invite your phone calls and questions on our anytime listener line at 888 chart. And we're moving into our final break. So I'm here for you now, taking your calls live. And this way we get to interact. I love those conversations. We love your, your voice bank questions. Those are great. But I like the live ones uh, so I can interact as well. So you have another five, six minutes or so to get your call in after this final break. So give us a call now at 888 chart One of the most rewarding things I do each weekday is host the Invest Talk podcast. I truly enjoy helping investors. And I know that every question counts and every answer I provide will be unbiased. You, the caller, get to chart the course for each Invest Talk podcast. Call with your questions anytime, day or night, 888 99Chart. Hello, Justin and Kalayan. This is Ali from Middle East. I just want to know uh, or ask for the meaning of the maturity for some ETFs. Uh, some ETFs say uh, the maturity is uh, three to six months. And does that mean? Uh, should I sell that is uh, in the in the period time, like from three to six months or six to nine months or whatever? I hope my question is clear. Thank you for everything. What uh, I assume you're talking about are certain short-term ETFs that are have bonds that mature. A certain interval, uh, and so I use example SHY is a good example. So that's the iShares one to three year Treasury bond ETF. Now all of that means is that the Treasury bonds it's buying are going to mature in one to three years. 
that doesn't mean the fund matures or anything like that. It's just the strategy. And so if it's three to six months, that's very short term uh, bond portfolio. So it's, it's just describing the maturity, the, the duration that it is buying in on the bonds that it's, it's holding. For example, the SHY, its effective duration is 1.8 years. So it's you know, right, going to be right in that middle of that range. One to three, it's a little bit lower than that, that two, uh, which would be the middle of that range. And obviously, that's going to fluctuate. I'm not sure how they decide how long duration is going to be, but that's what they're, they're, they're explaining. Now, there are some what are called bullet shares. I know they've come out with some of those, and those do have maturities of different dates. And so it says things like the, you know, the bullet share high yields 2028 fund. And that means that all the bonds they're buying are maturing in 2028. And yes, at that time, actually, you're going to get all your money back upon, after 2028. And that ETF is going to go away. So the bullet share is the only ones I know that have they, they have a maturity date of the actual ETF. Whereas the a lot of these other short-term bond ETFs, that's just describing the type of investments they're making and the duration of those bonds that they're holding. Okay, thanks for the call. Now let's touch a bit on profit margins as we are really kicking into gear the second quarter earnings results. And analysts are expecting about an 8.1% drop in earnings overall. Now, analysts are typically too pessimistic by this time of earnings season, they kind of sandbag the earnings expectations. So it's probably not going to be a decline, earnings decline that large, but it certainly won't be positive, let's just say that. And part of that is colored by buybacks. If you actually look at the expected net income, that's, also, that's supposed to be down 11.4% year over year. So when you're looking at earnings per share, remember, you can have earnings slightly down, but if you bought back the same percentage of shares, you're going to have flat earnings overall, right? Earnings per share. Now, revenue as a whole is expected to be down 0.9%. And so it's showing you that margins are going to con are continuing to decline. There's probably, there's two reasons for this. One is that the cost of labor continues to go up. And you also have, uh, you have, it's more difficult to raise prices. Branded cons consumer staples is a good example. They were doing very, very well during the pandemic because everyone had money in their pocket, right, from the government. So most people were employed. And, you know, they went to the store, they went to Target, and they, they bought Target instead of, sorry, they bought, uh, they bought Tide instead of the store-bought brand, a private label brand of laundry detergent. You know, they had some extra money in their pocket. They're okay with paying that extra buck in order to get the brand that they know. Well, when budgets get tighter, they tend to trade down, and that's what you've seen, seen happening. So it's the cost of labor. It's also the more difficult, more competitive environment to raise prices. And that's why you continue to see margins come down. Now, once again, these are, this is a reversion to the mean. And so that's the environment you're in. The question is, will we go well past the mean uh, in coming quarters of uh, profit margins? Okay, uh, so they'll, they'll continue to come down and we'll watch to see if they beat expectations or not. Now, I'm Justin Klein. This completes another Invest Talk program. Steve Peasley and I thank you for listening. We encourage you to tell your friends and family about our free podcast downloads, which you can find anytime at iTunes, Spotify, or Google Play. And be sure to rate and review. Remember to follow Invest Talk on social media and like and tag us to help everyone in the Invest Talk community. Independent thinking, shared success. This is Invest Talk. Good night. Invest Talk is a trademark of KPP Financial. Because of the nature of the interactive dialogue inherent in the format of this program, it's important for the listener to understand that not all comments made will apply to them. Specifically, nothing said shall be taken to be investment advice, or shall statements on this program be considered an offer to buy or sell security. Because such advice is rendered solely on an individual basis and at times will require that the investor review a prospectus before investing. 
Invest Talk is a copyrighted program of Klein, Pavlis, and Peasley Financial, a registered investment advisor firm which retains all rights. For more information regarding KPP's investment advisors, call 1 800 557 5461. Steve Peasley is president, and Justin Klein is chief executive officer of Klein, Pavlis, and Peasley Financial. <laughs>